we want to create ecosystems. We don't want to create proprietary solutions um, because a proprietary solution is a centralized solution. An open right. standard means that you have access to any, like uh, the consumer has the power and access to whatever they want to use in the market. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global ID podcast. Today, we're going to be talking SSI and verifiable credentials with Dev, a uh, software architect and product owner at Global ID. Dev, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah. Um, so my work at Global ID generally focuses around the open source um, specifications for verifiable credentials and decentralized identities. Um, Global ID is focused on making our identity infrastructure um, compatible with everybody else, interoperable, et cetera. And to do so, we, we are embracing these kind of open standards. And my work is integrating those standards into our applications. Cool. Do, do, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how, how you got into this space? Um, and, you know, because I, I, I know from, from our history, I met you originally. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I've been in identity for a long time. Um, so I got into identity out of hackathons. Um, I founded a company uh, built around decentralized identity before any of the, 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 you know, the stuff that we use today came out when we were still building on top of things like Ethereum and we didn't really have the, um, any open standards or anything. Um, so that was my first company. Um, and then I founded another identity company after these standards came out, focused on uh, implementing Hyperledger Aries and Hyperledger Indy. Um, and then Global ID kind of absorbed us um, and said, hey, you guys are doing the same thing that we wanna be doing, you wanna do it with us instead. Um, and so now we're implementing basically those open standards here at Global ID. Um, but I've been identity, yeah, a long time. The thing that I love about it is identity is one tool to a bigger puzzle. And the bigger puzzle that we'll talk about later today that like gets me really excited and going is ad hoc governance. Basically the concept that any two people around the world at any given point can say, I want to do business with you, or I want to do some kind of transaction with you, whether that's sending money, whether that's messaging someone, um, exchanging information, any, anything like that. And they can create a jurisdiction between just those two parties or within a community. And this is drastically different than how we've been doing jurisdictions um, pr uh, prior to this. Up until now, when we talk about jurisdiction, when we talk about a contract between two parties, that's always been um, a, uh, curtailed to a geographical context, right? So I can create a contract and then a US court will uphold it or a Chinese court will uphold it. Well, what if I want to create a contract and now I can have a community uh, that we're a part of that, just, that transcends geographic boundaries and maybe the commonality between us is that we're all just, you know, um, we all have the uh, have a similar water bottle or we all like belong to a volunteer organization, an NGO of something. So whatever that commonality is, we can create a jurisdiction just around that. Um, and then identity is the tool with which we can interact um, in that governance model. Very cool. Well, why don't we take a step back for a second, right? And, and because I know, you know, primarily your work centers around uh, verifiable credentials. Do, do you want to take a second and explain uh, what exactly is a verifiable credential and, and why does it matter, right? Yeah. So the two open standards that we talk about when we talk about verifiable credentials is something called a DID doc, D-I-D doc, which is a decentralized identity document and a verifiable credentials. These are both open standards that are issued by the W3C consortium, the World Wide Web Consortium. And what they largely do um, is they allow us uh, to say, I wanna build XYZ system and I want my system because the way my data is structured to be able to interact with anybody else that's building on the same system. So when Global ID thinks about um, identities, that identity, like when we issue an identity, when we issue a credential of some kind, and I'll get into that, what that is in a second, that same credential can be used by a different system entirely because we're using the same standard. An example of this is how you use different web browsers to go to the same website because all the same websites are written in HTML, which is an open standard. 
and I can have Brave, I can have Chrome, I can have Firefox, whatever application and company that I want to support and use can go to google.com or facebook.com or any of these websites. Um, and so that open standards help us create an ecosystem where we have multiple different um, entities being able to use that thing. Now, what these open standards are, that's a whole separate topic. So in DigDoc, a decentralized identity document um, is basically like, um, if you know what Linktree is, um, a Linktree uh, is, uh, is a uh, web website that basically lets you say, these are all of the, like, if, if I visit my homepage or if I go to Space Mind Dev, right, um, here are the links of where I am, uh, you can see me on the internet. So a did doc will say, here are my asymmetric cryptographic keys. So if you want to send me some information, this is the, these are the keys to encrypt it with. Here's a mailbox. Maybe this is an email that you can use for me. Here is a uh, mailbox for, I don't know, this is my MySpace account. This is my Facebook account. Basically a list of information about the user published somewhere. So we generally talk about anchoring these on top of um, ledgers like Hyperledger Indy, the Bitcoin blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain, because uh, those ledgers are kind of prevalent. But you could anchor this did doc basically on a GitHub repository, wherever a network of communities wants to um, anchor it. So that's one thing that's that's called a did doc. And basically, that's just a, um, a list of information about a specific person. Um, at the very minimum, at the very minimum, the a did doc requires asymmet uh, asymmetri uh, asymmetric keys, basically saying, these are my cryptographic keys to use to encrypt and decrypt information. And at most, it can be a multi, multi-page long document that has a bunch of more information. The second piece of this is a verifiable credential, which is a completely different open standard. A verifiable credential goes from saying uh, uh, one party to another party. So we usually have some kind of issuer. Um, the issuer being, say, like on Fido, Verif, um, your university, like well, wherever you went to, um, saying, I want to issue you some information. And you can think of a credential like, um, like your degree. A degree is a paper credential. You have an, uh, an issuing institution, and that issuing institution signed a piece of paper that holds some information about you. In this case, that you got a bachelor's or uh, master's or PhD in something. In the same way, a digital verifiable credential takes the issuer, whatever, whoever they are, takes some information, they sign it with their cryptographic keys, and then gives it to the holder. The reason this is important is this is the first time where we have the data itself being held by the person who receives the data instead of some other company. Just like a paper credential, like you hold your driver's license, you hold your uh, degree, um, you get to hold that digital data on your devices, whether that's a mobile device, a laptop computer, whatever else, um, rather than a company holding that and then someone else needing to talk to a company and saying, hey, did Dev actually go to this school? Right. Um, and I want to talk about really quickly why this is important. Um, imagine you go to a private school or you go to a for-profit school. A for-profit school issues you a diploma. If I want to verify that diploma, I need that for-profit school to either like stay around or uh, basically like I call, a, call them up and say, hey, is this diploma valid? By anchoring that information onto a ledger and then giving you the diploma itself, that for-profit school might go out of business and I can still verify that diploma. Right. Um, and I can create, and you can build so many more services around this kind of thing. So, so it sounds like with, with a verifiable credential, it, it sort of eliminates the need for some sort of centralized intermediary to, to manage your credential for you. Um, yeah, that's yeah. why we call them decentralized identity. Right, right. Um, and then, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, the, the challenge there then it has to, you know, be built around these open standards so that, you know, everyone can sort of talk to each other in the same way, essentially. Yeah. We want to make sure that whenever um, we want to create ecosystems, we don't want to create proprietary solutions um, because a proprietary solution is a centralized solution. An open right. standard means that you have access to any, like uh, the consumer has the power and access to whatever they want to use in the market. 
Um, and if they don't like one company, they can go to another and it doesn't matter. Like you don't like Chrome because it takes up too much memory usage, go use Firefox. Doesn't matter, you can still access your same websites. So right. it's empowering uh, consumer choice. So it empowers the individual, it's decentralized, it's interoperable, and it's portable. Yeah. Um, all Privacy, of, security, portability, those are the three standards. All of which are also, you know, core pillars of, of global ID and, and SSI. Do, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, the role that verifiable credentials play within the global ID identity platform and ecosystem? Yeah. And so this is actually um, something very exciting that we're working on. Um, with Global ID, we have kind of three ways that you can kind of get credentials and use credentials. Um, the first way is our credential app store. And that is a way for you to get credentials from verified issuers. Places like on Fido, Verif, etc. So you might take your government documents and say, hey, look, I have a passport, can you issue me a digital credential so I can use this in a digital context? So that's one way. Another way you can get credentials within the Global ID ecosystem, which is kind of unique to us, is community credentials. So if I, for example, have a group for wine lovers of Chicago, and you are, um, you are someone who is highly respected within that community, you might get an, an accreditation from that community and say, hey, this group of 50,000 people thinks that you're someone who we should listen to about wine. Um, and then you can use that credential and then say, go to San Francisco and go to the wine, lover, uh, wine lovers um, group in San Francisco and say, hey, look, I'm coming from this other community. It's similar to yours. It has 50,000 members. Um, this is, and, and uh, they have given me basically a vouch. They have given me um, this uh, trusted credential that says, um, I am X, Y, Z, like I have some information about me that that's on that credential. So that's another way that we're using credentials that's kind of unique. Um, and the third way is self-declared credentials, basically anchoring information. So I can basically say um, I have, um, I live at X, Y, Z address and I can just declare that. Um, and then I can use it in multiple places and they know that because it was declared at time, um, at this time, it hasn't changed since then. Um, now, how we use them is um, basically through communities and then through Global ID Connect. So communities can ask for credentials. Basically, um, I can set up a community and say, maybe I want to discuss politics. Well, I only want to, I want to set up, I'm from Chicago. I want to set up a group to discuss Chicago politics. And I only want people to join the group if they are a resident of the city of Chicago. What I can do is I can set up membership screening on my group and say, hey, I only want people to be able to join that show a credential that says um, that they are a, a resident of Chicago. And that way I am now curated this group where I can discuss politics, where I can gatekeep around that commonality as I see fit. Um, so that's one way. Another way is through Global ID Connect. If I'm a developer and I'm building applications, uh, for example, I'm building a website um, and I want someone to be able to get, like I, I'm building a trading platform or a Venmo um, or whatever. And I want people to be able to show that they have a um, social security number. One of the things that I can do is I can use Global ID Connect to ask them for a credential that has a social security number. Now here's another really cool piece of credentials. Credentials allow for something called zero knowledge proofs, which means that I can ask for a social security number and then just know that the, the person sending me the data has a valid social security number issued by the US government without ever revealing what the number is that sells. And now I know that everyone on my website that's logging in is um, a US resident or at least has a social security number. So when they do uh, monetary transactions, um, mm -hmm. I, can, I can make sure that those are done in a safe and secure manner. All of that sounds Amazing. And, you know, we, we, we know that people are taking identity a lot more seriously now in the EU. Um, they're coming out with their identity wallet. Apple recently announced that, you know, they're going to have features that allow you to digitize your driver's license on your iPhone. Um, clearly, you know, the, the decentralized approach has a lot of benefits, particularly uh, in the context of consumers of the individual. What do you see as, as sort of 
the challenges of, of sort of bridging, you know, that gap from where we are with this sort of new novel framework um, to, you know, getting, getting this in the hands of, of ordinary people? So I think one of the biggest challenges is um, account recovery, which is to say um, credentials are built around the concept that you get them on a physical device, right? They don't live on a cloud. They don't live in the server somewhere. They live on your hands on a mobile device or your laptop computer or a hardware wallet of some kind. Now, the nice thing is Global ID is actually working on a number of ways to do uh, convenient account recovery. We have something called trustees. We have something called trusted partner. Like uh, basically you can say, I want um, to share my backup security with four or five friends. And then um, of those friends, at least three of them have to say that I'm me and I can recover my account. And that way, even if I lose my device, I can get all of my credentials back and I can get all of my access back. Um, the second problem is a chicken and an egg, which is um, people won't accept credentials unless there are people issuing credentials and people won't issue credentials unless there are people accepting credentials. So one of the approaches that Global ID is using to solve that is automated credential issuance, which is to say within our communities, if you are taking certain actions, you might automatically get credentials. Um, or if you're accessing wallet, we um, need a credential. So we, uh, you are going to go through that flow and have one. Um, and so we're doing a number of activities in which basically to bootstrap people having usable, valuable credentials, um, and then working with our partners to accept those in relevant places. Gotcha. <clears throat> And, and there's also a few organizations out there um, that are helping to support a lot of these projects and, and movements. You know, one of them is the Linux Foundation. Uh, and we recently announced that we were a founding member of the Cardea Project, which is part of uh, the Linux Foundation public health arm. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what the Cardea Project is? Yeah, so the Cardea Project basically um, is a approach for open source tooling um, and open source standards around the um, COVID-19 crisis. So basically, um, because of COVID-19, one of the things that we are using to solve for COVID-19 are vaccines, right? So, um, but we have tons of different vaccines in tons of different areas. Um, the concept of a vaccine passport has been thrown around, the concept of a vaccine card, um, you know, uh, showing that when you're traveling. And basically we have a lot of different standards. And so the Cardia group or the Cardia project basically hopes to do two things. One, standardize um, a schema, uh, standardize some kind of um, language such that when uh, people are across the world asking for these credentials, yeah. they have um, a common like a common standard that says like, just like we say, a passport needs to have these requirements. Um, a vaccine credential needs to have these requirements. The second thing the Cardia Group is trying to do is basically allow for a number of open source tools. So anyone that wants to accept credentials, anyone that wants to issue credentials has access to an open source tool that they don't have to pay for, they can set up and start issuing um, and, and using credentials. And then um, they can then uh, do complex rules on that, like saying, oh, I'll accept credentials from any group um, that, uh, that has vouched for this issuer and so on. And basically setting up all of those processes uh, and making that as easy to use as possible. Gotcha. So what, what, is, um, what is the thing that you're working on right now that you're most excited about? So most excited and most stressed about um, one of the things that recently the community has started adopting is something called BBS plus signatures. And we're going to get a little nerdy, but I'm going to try to keep it high level if I can. Okay. Um, previously, we were, uh, the community as a whole was using Hyperledger Aries and um, Hyperledger Indie. Hyperledger Indie is a blockchain and Indie was kind of created before these standards came out. And so there's a lot of things that they did that require you to use an Indie ledger which is kind of problematic. Remember we talked about interoperability. Well, if I want to use Bitcoin or I want to use Ethereum or I want to use a GitHub repository or I want even within Hyperledger Indie, if I want to talk to Sovereign or Indicio, which are two completely different networks, 
my interoperability breaks. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is that BBS plus signatures um, are allowing us to do better interoperability. Instead of being tied to a specific indie ledger, um, anyone can show any credential from any ledger and we can do a lookup and say, oh, you're on Bitcoin and this credential uh, was issued by the issuer sovereign or issuer on Fido on Bitcoin. And this credential was issued by Verif on Ethereum or on Hyperledger India on Indicio. Cool, we can accept all of them um, without the user having to like pick and choose and try to figure out which is from where. And so that kind of interoperability is like that, that was a missing piece of puzzle. Mm -hmm. So stressing me out because it's a lot of work for us to upgrade all of our infrastructure to support all of that but also very excited about it because now we have this kind of really cool interoperability and this really cool um, user experience that we're building. Awesome. Well, Dev, I certainly learned a lot today. Uh, is there anything else on your mind? No, I'm just really excited for verifiable credentials. Um, I, I will talk about one thing. I think one of the really cool pieces uh, that's kind of topical is voting. Um, and so one of the things that um, I think we're looking into is how can we use verifiable credentials when we're voting? Because, uh, you know, um, voting is a sensitive topic around the world and how we allow for democratic access. And I think one of the really cool pieces that will enable digital voting solutions and enable like good digital voting solu uh, solutions yeah. is that digital identity layer that's built on top of verifiable credentials. So that's another thing that I'm really excited about as a, as a uh, potential product, um, whether Global ID pursues it, whether there are other uh, pursuants. So if you're someone who's interested in um, verifiable credentials or if you're someone who is interested in decentralized identity, definitely look into um, what digital voting solutions are coming out because I think that's going to be kind of like the killer use case that makes, um, that makes digital uh, IDs and um, verifiable credentials take off. So just thinking from like, say the government's perspective, right? Like why, why might they prefer the decentralized approach to say a centralized approach? For a number of reasons. Um, so one, one reason is basically um, right now we have voter databases and voter databases get hacked. Yeah. Uh, when I like there, there is a, something called like, you can go in and you can, um, there's a possibility of counterfeiting your identity, for example, I show up as someone, but I have a fake driver's license and I can possibly vote as them. Or I can create a honeypot of voter identity, um, voter identities, and then I can hack in and steal all this information about voters, whether it's the DMV or whatever else. From the government point of view, um, again, we the three pillars we talked about, privacy, security, portability. Privacy, when I submit a vote, no one knows that it was me. I don't, they don't even know what voting location I showed up to. Like you can set up a camera at a voting location and kind of see, oh, like 200 people showed up. These are the people that go to these voting locations, which means by the way, that I can do um, denial of votes, right? I can, I can shut down voting locations based on race or um, social, uh, socioeconomic status. Um, well, if I do digital identity or digital voting, that goes away. So privacy, I as a voter can submit my vote without being discriminated upon based upon some physical, um, you know, uh, thing that I have about me or some other uh, attribute uh, that's tied to me. Secondly, security. Digital votes are a lot more secure um, when, when uh, tabulated because there's a ledger. We can, there's a zero knowledge pr uh, proof of that vote. There's a cryptographic proof um, of who voted, when they voted. Um, and when I say who, it's an anonymized vote, but basically saying that only one per, like, per identity that we have issued, that identity voted once and only once. We can tabulate all those votes um, and we can, uh, we can give you like digital voted stickers. So you can say, I am actually a civic participant. If I wanted to brag about the fact that for the past four years, I have been an active voter, mm -hmm. then I can go to my um, civil servants. I can go to the people in government and say, look, you should listen to me because I am an active voter. I did show up in the past four years um, and voted, I, you know, uh, and voted. Um, so privacy, security, and then portability. Um, I can take that information, I can take my credentials and move them from silo to silo. And a really cool example of this are things like unemployment benefits or healthcare benefits. Right now, there's a number of benefits that um, whether you're in Illinois or in a different state, um, state-sponsored benefits. But each of these services lives in silos, which means that there's an application process um, and each, you basically have to take paperwork 
from each service and take it to another service, it's a massive um, uh, spider web of, of different, different data standards and different um, identities that you hold with all of these different services. So I might have a identity with um, the department for um, unemployment and then a different identity. Um, I, it's still me, it's just I have to create a separate account and a separate um, in, information uh, table with the Department of uh, uh, Motor Vehicles. Well, what if I just had a singular identity and then I, the, the government didn't need to maintain 20,000 different databases that have the same copy of my information 300 times and one of them goes out of sync or whatever else. So privacy, security, portability, and then just making things simpler for the end user. Well, it sounds like the future of democracy rests on uh, the little old verifiable credential. I think it's definitely uh, one of the most promising tools with which we can improve democracy. And this is what I was talking about at the beginning, ad hoc governance, right? Building these jurisdictions, building more democratic institutions. The great thing about the internet was the internet decentralized and democratized information. Then we had things like Bitcoin come out and they decentralized and democratized money. And verifiable credentials are decentralizing and democratizing identity. So that's what we're trying to, trying to build here, that kind of um, stepping stone to the next big um, change in information. I love it. We've, we've come full circle. Dev, thank you for the education and the inspiration. Uh, really appreciate your time. This is a great chat, and I'm sure our viewers uh, will learn a lot. Thank you all uh, for tuning in, and we'll see you guys on the next one. See bye you. Bye.